Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for another live premiere of Hospice Simcoe's Grief Matters Ended Beginnings webinar series. Tonight, we will be joined by our speaker, Dr. Stephanie Gilbert, who will be presenting on returning to work. Dr. Gilbert is an associate professor in the Shannon School of Business at Cape Breton University. Her research examines predictors of leadership effectiveness and emergence, including leaders' own motivation for leadership, and examines how grieving employees experience work. Over the course of this webinar, Dr. Gilbert will be exploring leave options, employee slash employer rights, what returning to work can look like, effective bereavement support in the workplace, and so much more. For those of you attending the premiere this evening, a live chat will be available for the duration of the webinar. Our speaker, as well as a social worker from Hospice Simcoe, will be hosting the live chat. So please engage if comfortable. Ask questions, share stories and comments, connect with our speakers, staff, and each other. Following this webinar, should anyone have any questions or feedback, please contact Hospice Simcoe's Community Support Office at 705-725-1140. This video will remain on Hospice Simcoe's YouTube channel as a resource for all who need it. I will now pass things over to Dr. Gilbert. Take it away. Hi, good evening. My, Steph my name is Stephanie Gilbert and uh, I'm coming to you from Cape Breton, um, way on the East Coast, but very happy to be able to speak and share about some of the insights that I've gathered from research I'm doing and um, talking to a lot of people who have experienced pregnancy loss and then gone back to work. So in this session, I'm gonna share some insights about what might be helpful for those of you experiencing pregnancy loss uh, when you go back to work. And I realize that many of you watching are going through pregnancy loss right now or have gone through in the past. And if that's the case, I'm so sorry for your loss. And I recognize the difficulty in that. Um, I've had a loss, I've had losses myself and have been back to work after those losses. And that is one of the reasons, the main reason of course that I'm doing this research is that I understand how little support there is out there um, for employees going through pregnancy loss. And so I am doing, along with my colleagues, Jennifer Demoff and Jacqueline Brady, um, some research right now on employees' experiences going back to work after loss. And I want to share a little bit about that work and some of the strategies that we're identifying in that work and what, things we've heard from some of our study participants about what is helpful for them going back to work after their pregnancy losses. Um, so... The first thing I want to establish is that pregnancy loss is a workplace issue. Um, you can see here, this is just a meme that I shared on my on our social media page. Um, it says employees who have lost a pregnancy are more likely to quit their jobs, to change careers, and to suffer from impaired work performance for months to years afterwards. And we hear so often from our study participants and just people we know in, in general daily life, you know, our friends, our family members who have gone through this themselves, that there's nothing like a pregnancy loss to give you a different kind of perspective on your life and what's really important, right? Um, we find that a lot of people who go through pregnancy loss end up having, you know, a lower threshold for the crap in life. Um, and not as likely to deal with the hassles and problems they might have dealt with before. And um, so there are many reasons why people decide to quit their jobs. It could be that change in priority. It could be that you, you know, you want to be able to connect your loss to your workplace. And that could be difficult depending on the nature of your job. Um, it could be that people find it really difficult to go back to work and have the same type of performance that they had previously due to their brief symptoms, um, trauma symptoms, their physical symptoms. So there could be a lot of barriers there. And, you know, lots of people decide to stay home and, and spend more time with their families. So there's so many different reasons for these changes that can take place. But we know too that because pregnancy loss has that physical component and 
the psychological component and the grief that comes with it, that work performance can be impaired, especially if um, the grief itself and, and the recovery is not supported it, at work. And we know that that's, um, you know, you're very lucky if you are supported well after pregnancy loss at work. And there are rarely any formal policies in workplaces that deal with pregnancy loss. So pregnancy loss is a workplace issue. And I want to acknowledge that because lots of, you know, even I have trouble in research with journals or whatever saying to me, well, that's a personal issue. It doesn't have any place in management. And it absolutely does because pregnancy loss both happens in the workplace and uh, it, it affects the workplace. It affects behaviors at work, your ability to perform, your ability to focus and concentrate um, and physically do your work as well. So it is a workplace issue. And my colleagues and I really advocate for the fact that workplaces should support pregnancy loss, support people going through that. So I wanna just note that going back to work after a pregnancy loss can feel incredibly significant and even almost like a return to society. Depending on how much time you had off work, maybe it's very little to no time off, or maybe you had you know, a few months off of work, that regardless, going back to work can still feel like quite a big transition. You might have concerns about things like, you know, how will that go? It's very unknown because sometimes with grief, it, it's unexpected when a trigger could affect you or it's unexpected when you might start to feel those emotions bubbling up. Um, so you might worry about things like crying at work. You might worry about how others at work might see you or treat you, the kinds of things they might say, um, whether you'll be able to handle the demands at your work, whether you get triggered at work, or might even feel embarrassed uh, if you start to cry, for example. Um, so there are any number of concerns you might have, and if so, it's totally normal. Um, what we hear from many people is that they have a, they have a hard time and even dread uh, the idea of going back to work at times. You can see here from this to-do list that I, this is a picture that I took of a to-do list um, not exactly the same as, but very similar to a list given to me by one of our participants. And that person was sharing that they had, this was a list from the week after, a 23 week um, stillbirth. And it, on the list you can see was a counseling appointment, a doctor's appointment for follow-up after the loss, but also a staff meeting at work. So handling the demands of that, You'll see there that there's cremation on the list. So her baby had been cremated and was ready to be picked up at the funeral home. And so she had to remember to do that. So there's tasks around memorializing early after the loss. And then she had a final report to edit. So really a lot of cognitively demanding work at a time when your ability to do that kind of work is really limited. Um, you know, and then along with the memorializing and the taking care of physical and psychological health, it is a lot of demands to take care of all at one time. So, you know, this is what we're juggling going back to work after pregnancy loss. Before I go forward, I want to um, highlight that, again, pregnancy loss is a workplace issue and that it is an issue that should be addressed in the workplace but also that your recovery from your, your grief recovery, your psychological and physical recovery, all of that is in the best interest of both you and your organization. So they might you know, not see the short-term benefit of supporting somebody through pregnancy loss, um, but in the long run, your recovery is in your best interest and your organization's best interest. So advocating your, for yourself in that sense is a win-win situation, especially in the long run. I wanna just share here um, a little bit of the research that I've been doing with my colleagues. And one of the studies that we did was interview study of 36 uh, employees who had had pregnancy loss and then gone back to work afterwards. 
And we asked them to tell us just what was that experience like? Can you tell us what was helpful? What was not helpful? What elements of that experience were significant to you? And we identified 13 themes that were kind of like on a timeline. So people did talk about their experience before their loss as relevant to their loss experience. So how did their pregnancy go? Was it difficult or hard? Did they have to take a bunch of sick, sick leave during their pregnancy time because they had symptoms to manage or appointments to go to or whatever? And did they disclose their pregnancy at work? You know, so some of these themes spanned over the work and non-work domains. Some were more specific to work like the pregnancy loss disclosure. If you disclosed your pregnancy, then you kind of have to disclose that you have a loss. But if you don't disclose your pregnancy at work, you might be able to not disclose that you've had a loss. And so we saw those issues as really interrelated. Also, if you took time off in your pregnancy or had a really difficult pregnancy where you required accommodations from your workplace or required time off, you might then um, not ask for as much time off after a loss. And so we find that some people feel badly that they've already taken time off or already received accommodation for their pregnancy and then felt like with their loss that they couldn't um, cash in all the rest of their chips is one way to put it. You know, like they couldn't ask for more because they've already received help. So the pregnancy experience and how that goes seems to really affect the loss experience. Now, when the loss actually takes place, place, um, we found workplace loss disclosure was very relevant to the whole experience. And again, you're more likely to disclose your loss if your pregnancy was already known at work. Um, otherwise, you might hide your loss and nobody would know at work that you were either pregnant or had a loss. Um, so workplace disclosure was certainly an important theme. And if you did disclose your pregnancy, that's when you were more likely to receive support at work. Others are aware of the situation and might then accommodate you or provide some leave or other types of support. The physical experience of the loss was very significant as well as the healthcare experience. So people had a lot to say, even though we didn't really ask. Um, you know, people, it was very important how their loss went down and, and what actually happened. And it's such an important part of their whole story. So we heard a lot of stories about the physical experience um, in many cases being kind of surprising, like women didn't know what to expect when they were about to have a miscarriage or stillbirth. They had very little information and um, maybe were surprised at how painful it, might, it was or how um, traumatic it felt. And similarly with the healthcare experiences, um, we heard that a lot of women, you know, felt like, oops, sorry, I want, I'm pulling up some of these um, quotations. A lot of women felt like they, you know, had tra traumatic experiences in the healthcare system. So one of the quotes was, I went to the general hospital and they wouldn't even see me because I was less than 20 weeks. So anyway, I left there, we went to another hospital and I had a horrible experience there. And the doctor really shouldn't have seen me as a patient. He didn't know what to do with me. And so we're hearing that in the loss process, there's kind of this stressful or even traumatic experience in the healthcare system. And um, that in itself is quite, um, quite difficult. And then that trauma and stress is brought into the workplace later on down the road. Certainly there are psychological responses that vary. Um, you know, people may be blaming themselves uh, at times or feeling to blame, feeling ashamed of having experienced loss. Um, some folks feeling quite numb afterwards or else having a lot of emotional distress and breaking down, you know. So the psychological response is very unique and how you experience that grief and trauma is very unique. One of the quotations we have was, it was emotionally exhausting to pull myself together. Honestly, I was faking everything. And this is at work later on um, because I was in such an emotional turmoil over my feelings and throwing myself into my job because I felt like that's what I should be doing. People are telling me that's what I should be doing. I don't know. What else am I going to do if I'm not working, right? 
So, you know, these complicated feelings about the loss and what should I do? Um, you know, how should I feel? It's not quite clear because there are really for pregnancy loss, no straightforward norms or guidelines about that since it's something we just don't talk about. Um, memorialization was also an important piece. So a lot of families, parents, um, and participants in our study talked about um, how they find way, found ways to remember their baby and honor their baby, um, you know, whether it's through a memorial service or a crafting process or, um, you know, writing in a journal, all, any number of, of things like that. Um, and, you know, so those are kind of some key themes. And we also found that men tend to have unique experiences. So they tended to be the ones that felt they needed to support their partner, maybe put their grief aside and be very strong for them. And men didn't tend to receive any kind of formal support. And um, their grief was even more kind of, disenfranchised, like not acknowledged by others because they weren't the mother, they weren't the one carrying the baby. So men did report having some unique experiences, but a lot of these themes came up in the men's uh, responses as well. We did have six men in our study who did the interviews. Now, when people go back to work, then we had kind of this different set of themes around workplace support, stigma, and the nature of leave. So in workplace support, for example, um, we saw that this varied very widely across everybody. Lots of the women were saying to us that when they went back to work and they did, if they did disclose their loss, then this kind of old girls network, they called it, one of the people called it an old girls network came out of the woodwork with their own stories of loss to share what they'd been through. And so you might be hearing from a colleague you'd worked with for 10 years, never having known they'd been through a miscarriage or a stillbirth. And now suddenly they're telling you this story and it's just something you've never talked about. And so that was one way we saw a lot of, of workplace support was really informal and largely by women in the workplace who were sharing their own stories. The support by managers varied entirely based on how compassionate the manager was. Um, and if the manager had had a loss themselves, that seemed to be helpful. So, you know, because there's very, very rarely ever any policies specifically dealing with pregnancy loss in the workplace, then the support tends to be less formal and would then depend on the leader. So one of the quotes we have here was after we lost the baby, maybe less than half of my coworkers commented or acknowledged it's really unfortunate when people don't acknowledge such a large moment in your life. So for many people, they found it most supportive when others just acknowledged and validated that they're going through something painful. And so that support really varied. Now, another element was stigma. And this, this is an issue where, you know, it's, it's pregnancy loss is still quite taboo and it's still quite silenced and something that we just don't talk about, right? I don't know if it's like too sad or there's this implication of shame or a blame with pregnancy loss that somebody did something wrong. And we know that pregnancy loss is not due to the mother doing anything wrong or the father doing anything wrong in the majority of cases, um, but stigma still is there. It's still kind of under the surface and was picked up uh, by most of our participants. One of our quotes was, going back to work is really, really hard um, after loss because people look at you different. I mean, they really wanna talk, but they don't wanna ask questions. Then you just, you kind of feel like the elephant in the room going back and you are. I was very aware that I was. And so I'm gonna talk about that feeling and how you might be able to manage that sense that you know others are really awkward because they just don't know what to say. And that's this underlying stigma. The other element of going back to work was what was your leave like? And the nature of the work leave varied a lot, but most popular um, form of leave for our participants was to combine sick leave and vacation time. Now I'm gonna talk about other options because 
as a lot of our participants noted, pregnancy loss isn't a vacation for sure. And you're not really sick either. So um, having a, a loss or sorry, a leave that is specific to the type of issue you're experiencing validates your pain. And there are some options for that. So many of our participants just took sick days or vacation because it was the easiest thing to do. And um, many of those participants felt looking back that they'd wish they'd taken more time or explored other options. Now, I will say, of course, if you've just had a loss, it's incredibly difficult to find the mental bandwidth to go looking for this kind of information. So that's why I'm gonna share with you what your options are today. And I completely understand why people just take the sick leave and take the vacation. I mean, it's often the easiest route, um, often doesn't really require asking for permission or special favors. And, um, and there, so that makes a lot of sense, but there are other options. Um, now the, in the long run, the return to work experience is varied widely. And, you know, talking about things like when you go back to work, what is that like for you? How do you handle the demands of that? So there were a bunch of different themes around that. One of the quotes that we have here is looking back right now, I really don't think I was ready to go back to work, but it seemed like so much effort to try to mental effort really to try to figure out if I could take more time, especially more time without needing to worry about my work because I was the only person doing my tasks. So we heard of many people going back to work because they knew work was piling up for them. They knew nobody else was there. They knew maybe colleagues were having to take over their workload. And so a lot of people felt pressure to go back to work maybe before they were ready. But other people had like really supportive work experiences where say they had a gradual return to work process, like they could ease back in and, um, and that worked really well for them. So I'm gonna talk about some of the strategies people mentioned about um, having a positive return to work experience. In the long run too, lots of people mentioned that their loss changed their life perspectives. So some people saw their work differently. Some people saw, you know, had reduced motivation after their loss for their work. Um, lots of people decided they really wanted to spend their time doing things that were more meaningful or maybe more connected to their loss. Um, so these changes might happen for you as well or might have happened. Um, and again, we see people after these significant losses, like changing careers, um, leaving the workforce and making these big changes as a result for various reasons. So one of the quotes we have from our study was, I'm just not as married to work now as I was. I have a totally different outlook on what's important. Before I wouldn't have these conversations, I'd be nervous because what if I wanted to have a child and the timing is wrong? But now I don't care if I get pregnant again, I'm not going to stress about where that leaves my employer. I big time see my work differently now. Loss totally shifts your world. So there is certainly a long-term impact to these types of losses where you're losing your baby, you're losing the future with that baby. And um, it really can shift your life perspectives. So these are kind of the main themes. And then you'll see at the bottom that partners experiences play into each of these um, time periods. And so what we mean by that is that you might be having your experience with the loss and your own work experience around that, but also your partner is having their own unique experience and they're very interrelated. So you're seeing your partner go through it and their experience is affecting you. And there's like this reciprocal relationship with that. And with work, what we saw was partners are watching their, their you know, each other's workplaces respond in different ways. And like, if your partner's um, workplace is being really supportive and your own workplace is not, then you might feel happy for your partner but that comparison means you might be less happy with your own workplace, that they're not supporting you. So we saw that too. And um, the partner's experiences really affected one another. So I wanna share a little bit more about these themes and some of the recommendations we can pull out from these for you. Um, 
So I'm going to talk about a few things that I think might be um, most important for you to consider when you're going back to work after a pregnancy loss. And these are really the things that, going, that are going to not only help your recovery, um, but also help your performance. And so by recovery, I don't mean that you will be all better in a few, you know, a few months or even a few years, but that um, you'll have, you'll begin that process of healing and that will be a long-term thing. Um, but anything that you can do to try to facilitate that process and help yourself and even help others to help you because pregnancy loss is still so stigmatized that people don't talk about it and don't know how to help even though it's very common, um, it's not, you're not alone. If you're experiencing pregnancy loss, it's so common. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's not also extremely painful and devastating. So I want to just talk about some of the things that I think might be helpful to consider if you are planning to go back to work after your loss. And so the first is leave time. I'm going to be explaining some of the leave options that you have after a loss. Also, I'm gonna talk a little bit about accommodations at work and what the options might be there, both formal and informal. Um, Self-care is, is very important. I kind of hate that word. It kind of adds a new task for you. Um, but really what I mean there is to be gentle with yourself and look for those opportunities to either grieve or memorialize your baby and give yourself the grace and the time to heal um, it, because that does take time um, and and time too for your physical and psychological recovery um, there's going to be there might be doctor's appointments there might be follow-ups there might be need for physiotherapy and chiropractic care all kind of other things right um, and just time to heal but after pregnancy loss you are postpartum even if there is not a baby and there is recovery associated with that so it's just as important, even though there's not a baby, to take the time for that postpartum recovery. And then also I'm gonna talk about receiving support and where you might seek support, um, especially at work when you're going back after a loss. So in terms of your leave options, um, I think this is really important because as, as I said earlier, a lot of our participants found or told us that um, mainly they took sick leave and vacation time after a miscarriage or even a stillbirth. Um, and those are probably the easiest ways to quickly get time off um, without really having to pull any favors or ask for special treatment. Um, however, again, you're not on vacation when you're having a pregnancy loss and you're not even sick. You've been through a stigmatized health experience that may have been traumatic or at least stressful. And you're also experiencing grief and a lot of psychological effects of that loss. And there are uh, other options besides sick and vacation time that you can look into. So the first two that I'm gonna talk about are under the federal employment insurance system. Now, Canada, like Health Canada defines uh, stillbirth as a loss that takes place after 20 weeks. And it defines miscarriage as a loss that takes place before 20 weeks. So if you have a loss prior to 20 weeks and it's a miscarriage, and you're either a man, man or a woman, so you're the gestational partner or the, the other partner, then you qualify for EI sickness leave, as long as you qualify for EI. So traditionally, that's usually 600 hours uh, working hours. Um, it, had, it changed here and there throughout COVID, but if you qualify for EI, then you qualify for EI sickness leave. And what you need for that is a doctor's note. So both partners can have access to that leave. We've spoken to men who um, took EI sickness leave after their losses and men and women can qualify for that as well. 
if your loss takes place after 20 weeks, then it's qualified as a stillbirth. And you, as long as you qualify for EI, you can take up to 15 weeks of maternity leave. So under maternity leave benefits, there's kind of two sections of that maternity and parental leave. The maternity leave is that first 15 weeks that normally we would take after having a baby. And you still get to take that even if your baby is not alive. Um, you do not though get to take that parental leave portion. So EI maternity leave is an option for anyone having their loss after 20 weeks gestation. And it's the same EI benefit up to 15 weeks, up to $500 per week, depending on your salary. So the EI sickness leave does require a doctor's note, but EI maternity leave does not. You can take that um, and that can be, that can be put through, um, you know, you can apply for that through Service Canada, both of those through Service Canada. So those are two really important options for leave um, where you are receiving some pay. And um, I understand that um, you do need to qualify for EI in order to receive those options, um, but you can get a good chunk of time off through that program. Now, if you don't qualify for employment insurance, there are some options you can access through the Employment Standards Act. Um, and this would vary based on your province. So one of these options, and these are all unpaid options, the next three that I'm going to discuss. So one is unpaid pregnancy or maternity leave. And this would be leave where you are not paid, but your job is protected. In Ontario, for example, you can get up to 17 weeks of unpaid leave as long as your loss took place after 23 weeks gestation. If it's prior to that, you do not qualify for um, this unpaid protection of your job. But that's another option. I know financially that might not be feasible for some, but if you can financially swing that, or at least some of that time, you can have your job protected. Another option is sick leave through the Employment Standards Act, also unpaid, only three days though of time in each calendar year where your job is protected, um, though you are not paid. Another option that you might be able to combine with the sick leave is family responsibility leave, which in Ontario is three days long per calendar year, again, unpaid, but you could combine with sick leave to have six days of unpaid days where your job is protected. So those are some unpaid options, um, perhaps not ideal, but uh, if you don't qualify for EI, you should have access to these benefits. Now, the next ones I'm gonna talk about would be like through your work. And so the first is your work policies. And this is something that you could ask your HR manager or your boss, your supervisor, what you qualify for. Um, some of these might include paid bereavement leave. Now I put that in there, but rarely ever do bereavement leave policies include pregnancy loss within them, unfortunately. So it's often quite a gray area whether or not you qualify for bereavement leave if you've had a pregnancy loss. So in, in some cases, participants had some luck and were granted bereavement leave. In other cases, they were not. But you can ask for that. The other option might be the sick days or the personal days that you might qualify for, uh, or EI top-ups might be available. So if you qualify for EI and your workplace has a top-up, EI top-up, you should still qualify for that, um, for maternity leave, for example. Um, another benefit might be short-term disability leave if you have access to that through your benefits plan. So with short-term disability, it would be facilitated through your benefits plan or like through an insurance company your workplace is affiliated with, and you would be assigned a case manager who would keep in regular contact with you um, to make sure that you still cannot do the requirements of your job um, and need to remain on leave. Now, I will say that this leave option, um, it will vary depending on the financial benefit of doing this, but often there's a greater administrative load than the other types of leave. You would need to see your doctor and your doctor fills out forms to submit. 
uh, you would need to submit forms and then do the regular check-ins with your case manager. So people that we know who have taken advantage of this leave option, um, some wished they had done EI maternity leave instead, where you're kind of left alone for the period of time and there's not the same administrative load. So these are some options that you can take advantage of. Um, I really, really wanna highlight those EI programs because uh, again, as long as you qualify for EI, you should be able to get 15 weeks of leave, whether it's sickness leave for a miscarriage or maternity leave for a stillbirth. Um, so I just really wanna mention those because so few participants that we spoke to were aware that they were eligible for these. And many HR departments we're finding also are not aware that uh, employees might be eligible. Remember you deserve to recover. So whatever leave options you do take advantage of, um, you know, try not to feel that pressure to go back to work before you're really ready. Try to maximize that time if you can to go, you know, to stay home and recover at least physically uh, before you're back into the, the demands of work. Now, having said that, this is gonna be individual for each one of you. We've certainly spoke to people who felt they really benefited from being in the workplace, even very soon after their loss. Maybe they had a really positive and supportive work environment. Maybe they worked with close friends. Maybe their manager was incredibly supportive. And so they truly felt like going back to work early um, was supportive for them and beneficial for them. So um, everybody's going to be different. And I think it's important to note that you really are the only one that knows what's right for you. Um, but I do want to emphasize you deserve to recover from what you've been through and that, you know, try not to feel that pressure to go back to work sooner than you feel ready because we just hear from many of the people we speak to that they wish they had taken more time early on to, to grieve and recover. So I wanna just address that when you do go back to work, again, whether it's a few days later or you know weeks later, months later, you're probably going to be dealing with still some symptoms that could affect your work, depending on where you are on that timeline after your loss. So these symptoms are both psychological and physical. Um, you know, pregnancy loss is quite a unique type of loss because it does incorporate, you know, it's a physical experience and it's a very, it's a psychological experience together. And there's been a pregnancy and there's been a birth, um, you know, whether it's a miscarriage or a stillbirth or a surgery or you know, induced miscarriage or however that plays out, you know. So there's this physical experience and there's a postpartum experience as well. And then of course, there's this psychological experience. So um, it's quite, it's got these unique characteristics that require different types of support as a result. When you go back to work, what we find is those typical grief symptoms are probably still gonna be there and you're probably gonna be dealing with some of that to varying degrees. Now, everybody grieves differently, but some of the very common manifestations of grief include things like having a hard time concentrating and focusing. That brain fog, you know, sets in and things feel a little bit fuzzier. Um, emotional distress or unexpected crying, unexpected um, sadness can, can kind of wash over you at times. Exhaustion that grief can be incredibly exhausting to carry that around all the time. Heightened sensitivity in interactions with others. You know, so one day you might hear a comment and it's fine. And another day you hear the same comment and it's, and then you're crying in the bathroom, right? So, um, and it's sometimes hard to anticipate how we will react to things. So sometimes that, um, and, and triggers as well related to that, you might be triggered one day and not another by the same comment or interaction. Difficulty making decisions is a common symptom of grief and after pregnancy loss too, and lowered confidence as well. We've talked to a lot of women after pregnancy loss who go back to work feeling 
ashamed, feeling to blame, feeling like their bodies have failed them, feeling like they've done something wrong, you know, when they haven't. But that lowered confidence can seep into the way that you do your work and interact with other people. So that's all part of the psychological experience for many people. And of course, how everybody experiences it can be different. Physically, there's this postpartum experience after loss. So people, they go back to work bleeding, cramping, lactating and dealing with that or even having to pump at work, ongoing pain, fatigue, you know, weakness or limited mobility, right? So after my loss, my hips were all in, were in such pain and I needed postpartum physiotherapy, right? So there can be any number of physical symptoms, just like what we'd see with any pregnancy. Sometimes there's ongoing physical issues. So this is not to scare you, but rather to highlight for you that if you're going through these things, it's normal for you and that it's expected. And that if you are having difficulty at work, well, no wonder why, look at what you're dealing with. So um, all the more reason to provide as much time to recover as possible. So in returning to work, I just want to address a few kind of basic things um, around caring for yourself and kind of prioritizing yourself as much as you can. And one of the ways to do this might be to set boundaries and to think a little bit about when I go to work, when I go back to work, what, what will I be okay with? Um, what will I not be okay with? And maybe even think about planning um, for your time for grief, planning for your self-care time, planning for who are you okay with being around and who, do you, who might you want to avoid at work. So setting these boundaries as a way to kind of protect yourself a little bit from potential additional harm or, or distress. Um, maybe there are tasks you want to avoid when you go back to work. Maybe you'll have a lot of difficulty, for example, interacting with customers. And you might need to um, think about, are there ways that you can avoid those kinds of interactions? Or are there certain tasks that you might find just too difficult when you go back and you want to stick to something a little bit easier or something a little bit more um, repetitive or routine or familiar to you. So think about like, can you set any boundaries, right? Are there safe people that you can go to when you're, when you're back at work? Are there certain people you're comfortable sharing with or comfortable being around? And can you avoid other people? You might also want to think about, um, are there certain, um, are you okay with being contacted by your workplace while you're on leave? Like, do you wanna be left in the loop or would it be too stressful to receive any communications from your workplace while you're on leave? And can you request to have your preference? Um, those kinds of boundaries can be helpful. And that means that you do need to kind of communicate and say, look, I'm, I'm really finding it stressful to receive these work emails right now. Uh, I'm on leave, so please, you know, leave it until I come back and then I'll catch up. Um, you might also want to think about when you go back to work, can you add time into your routine for that grief? Can you add in room for that? You know, so whether that's um, clearly preserving your evening time and your weekend time for your healing and your grief time uh, and for self-care rather than to be doing long hours right away or rather than to be, you know, jumping back into overtime. No, so be extra gentle with yourself in the process. You're going through a lot, um, you know, so set those boundaries as best you can. Be gentle with yourself. Recognize that you've been through something very serious in your life. Um, try to make time for the self-care, like the movement, the healthy eating and the drinking, right? Some basic things but make a big difference. Again, make room for your grief and try to be in tune to your needs. Recognizing your needs might change from day to day, even hour to hour. Sometimes I found in my grief, I just never knew what to expect for myself. Um, 
And, you know, and that can be difficult alone. So with the self-care, I just mean, you know, try to prioritize yourself and your recovery. And it's in your best interest and it's in your workplace's best interest, whether they realize it or not. <laughs> um, now, I want to talk about seeking support at work. Um, and mainly because your workplace doesn't know how to help. <laughs> your workplace probably doesn't know what to do. We spoke to employees that work for very large organizations, and it was as if they were the first employee ever to have a pregnancy loss. And it was like their workplace had no clue what to do with them. And I just couldn't believe that. Like bereavement leave policies rarely include pregnancy loss in them. And so it's very unclear what kinds of leave options you might have. Now I've explained your options, but even your HR department might not know what those options are. So um, you can see how the support there could be really limited. If you're relying on your HR department to tell you what kind of options you have or your manager, they're probably even less likely to know. So seeking support at work is going to be a really difficult task for those of you who have recently had a loss, who are just coming back from work, and it, it takes just that extra effort to, to tell others how to help you. Sometimes you don't even know what's helpful, uh, what you need in any given moment, but your workplace definitely doesn't know what you need in a lot of cases. So I'm gonna explain a few strategies that could be helpful when you go back to work to seek support that you need. So in terms of approaching your manager, um, Remember that you absolutely have the right to ask for reasonable, reasonable accommodation. Um, and I have this here twice, I'm noticing. <laughs> but yeah, you have absolutely the right to ask for reasonable accommodation. And your organization has to consider that accommodation, but they aren't obligated to accommodate you. So you can always ask, though. And, you know, by asking for what you need, you are really helping your manager to help you um, because otherwise they have to guess or they assume that you're fine if you don't ask. So um, when you do approach your manager to seek support, understand that you have the right to do that um, and that you're trying to help them help you. Again, it's in the best interest long-term for your organization to do that. Also know your leave options, um, which I've just explained earlier, and know that it's helpful to explain your situation. Now, I understand some people will not have disclosed that they were either pregnant nor had a loss in the workplace, but as, as much information as you can provide so they understand this is something significant that and why you would need accommodation can be very helpful. So the types of accommodation that you request or can access might vary, and these can be both formal or informal. So some things that could be helpful going back to work after pregnancy loss could be things like having a flexible work schedule where maybe you can work um, certain hours or avoid the busy hours of the day, um, be at home with your family as much as possible, for example, or, um, you know, work around the hours that work best for you. Another option might be a hybrid work schedule or virtual work. So if you can work from home or partly from home, that might be a little more comfortable for you and then alleviate some of your concerns that you might have about um, getting upset at work or having to interact with other people at work. Um, more solitary or private work might be another benefit to some people, especially if you, know, you don't feel that you work with safe people, you're not comfortable around them, or um, for whatever reason, you don't feel um, you know, comfortable in your grief around certain people, then working alone or having a private place to work could be helpful. Some people really benefit from easier or different work tasks, you know, so maybe doing more administrative work rather than more complicated problem solving type work. 
um, or reduced interactions with customers, for example, might be helpful for a period of time. Some participants that we spoke with really benefited from a gradual return to work plan where, for example, they worked, you know, they just went into work for an hour the first day, stayed a couple hours the next day, and like gradually increased the time. So they weren't suddenly thrown into a full day of work and all the demands that come with that. <clears throat> Extra breaks can be helpful, especially if they can be flexible, because again, sometimes you don't know when that grief could wash over you and you might need a, a few minutes to cry and or you know, be upset or even write in a journal for a few minutes, um, talk to your partner or whatever could be helpful. So those extra breaks can be an informal type of accommodation that could be beneficial. A private place to go when needed also can be helpful. You know, some people we talked to would go to their car to cry, but others, you know, they benefited from a, a room in the back or a private office they could work in. Um, you know, one person in our study was actually reassigned to a more private, more remote office and really appreciated that so that she could have the chance to cry if she needed to. Um, now, so whatever accommodations you need are going to be unique to you and your needs might change over time. And so ideally, it would be great to have an open dialogue with your manager um, if they're supportive enough um, to let them know how your needs are changing and, you know, how they might be different, what accommodations might be suitable for you. So those are just some options, you know, some of the participants that we spoke to had other accommodations like, um, oops, sorry, like where um, one participant was working in a hospital and she was in food services and she would have to deliver meals all throughout the hospital. And she, her colleague volunteered to take meals to the labor and delivery and mom baby units because she found it so triggering, of course, to go to those units after her loss. And um, so that was one way that a colleague accommodated and supported her, but she was also assigned a second person on some of her early shifts so that she had a little bit of extra help and support and she found that really helpful. Um, so there are a number of different accommodations that we've seen, but um, it's going to really be dependent on your own needs in terms of what will help you. So I recognize that not everybody has disclosed their pregnancy and, or their loss at work. And there are many legitimate reasons why people do not disclose at work. Um, you know, lots of times people are waiting um, for that safe, you know, period at 13, 12 or 13 weeks. Um, so one of the quotes in our study was, I wanted to make sure I announced that before I announced anything that we were in that safe zone, that's really why I didn't disclose the pregnancy. And that that person then went on to not disclose their loss either. Um, another person who didn't disclose either their pregnancy or their loss said, I was in a contract position and I had the opportunity to be permanent and those are really rare. And so I feel like I almost didn't want to signal like, hey, I'm actually trying to start a family and there's a chance that I could be leaving you in however many months time. I didn't want that knowledge out there. So there are people who worry for their opportunities for a permanent position, for a promotion, um, for certain projects they want to assign to them. And so they don't disclose because they don't want to be passed over for those opportunities. Um, and there, so there's many other reasons as well why you would not disclose. And many of them are totally valid. It's very complicated. Um, so our advice for disclosure is that, you know, kind of think about, do I want to share or not share about this? And it's probably going to depend on your work context. Is it, is it supportive? Is it safe? What's your manager like, you know? But think about, do you want to share or not share? Think about why you want to share or why you don't want to share and how you would respond to other people, especially if they might, they, you know, don't respond how you'd expect. So if you share and you expect a lot of support from your colleagues, 
how would you feel or how would you respond if they do not support you? Um, and would that be okay? Um, so that might help in your decision is to just kind of spend a little time thinking through, uh, do I wanna share this? Now, we know that you're more likely to get support if you share. Um, if you do let your manager and your workplace and your colleagues know what you're going through, they are more likely to support you. Um, having said that, there are many reasons why you wouldn't wanna share. And I understand not every workplace is very supportive. Not every workplace, not every manager is very compassionate. Um, and there are reasons why you might choose not to share. So if you haven't disclosed your pregnancy at work, uh, you could still potentially offer a doctor's note requesting time off. Um, you can disclose perhaps to a safe person or to some safe people in order to re receive a little bit of support. So do you have a colleague who you're closer with? Um, is there a manager that you feel comfortable with sharing? If so, can you share just with them and it could be confidential and you could at least receive some support from them. Um, you could also certainly take vacation or sick days off without having to disclose and you should be able to access EI sickness benefits without disclosing the reason for taking those benefits too. So um, you still do have options for leave and for receiving support if you haven't disclosed your loss at work. Now, I wanted to share a little bit about the partner's experience here because through all of this, we know the women are going through a lot. Well, you know, men have a slightly different experience, also equally devastating. But men often receive less workplace support and fewer leave options. So pregnancy loss is a type of loss that people don't understand because we don't talk about it. And so the term for that is ambiguous loss that other people just really don't get what it is that you've lost here. Is it a child? Is it not a child? Is it the idea of a child? Um, is it just the future of that with that child? Like, what have you actually lost? Well, it's probably it's all those things, right? But um, it's really ambiguous and people really, especially if they haven't gone through it, don't get what, probably, you know, what this loss really is. So it's an ambiguous loss and it's also disenfranchised loss. So a disenfranchised loss is one that's not very, not well validated by society. And it's not really like your pain isn't made legitimate by society. It's kind of ignored, it's silenced and it's very isolating as a result. And so where women were pregnant and had the baby men were not pregnant and didn't have the baby, but they were still about to have a baby, you know, their wife or their partner was having a baby. And so because of all of that, you know, men had, had not have this physical signal that they were about to have a baby. Um, and uh, so they often receive less support and their grief is even more disenfranchised. Um, they also have fewer leave options, so they don't qualify for maternity leave. Um, you know, often they wouldn't even think about taking sick time because there's nothing physical going on in their bodies. Um, men often wouldn't see a doctor as part of this experience. It's their partner who's seeing the doctor. So they receive fewer leave options as a result. And then they feel really a lot of pressure to support their partner. Um, and so a lot of the men in our study talked about that significantly. Like they, they felt they had to kind of put on a brave face and a strong face and support their partner because clearly she was going through more. She, she was the one that had the miscarriage or the stillbirth. She was the one going through it physically. And so um, the men are playing that supporting role in a lot of cases. And for men, the loss is less obvious and more isolating. So I'll just, one of the quotes from one of the men said, I felt like I needed to be strong and supportive and put on that brave face because I knew what she was going through. So it was a bit of the brave face kind of thing. I know she's a worrier. So if she sees that I'm hurting, she's going to worry about me. And then she's not going to be worrying about herself and getting herself better. So partners certainly also have difficulty with going back to work. And a lot of these other themes apply to them as well. 
but these were the unique things that we could pick out about the partner's experiences. So what I've learned about grief and what I've read about it is that a lot of times anticipation of the significant milestones and events can be worse than the actual event. Obviously not always, but in a lot of cases, this is what I've, what I've read, what I've experienced myself. And that first day back to work can feel like one of those big milestone events where, you know, you're kind of returning to society, you know, you're kind of having to go back to normal after your leave time, if you had leave. Um, so in preparing for your first day back to work, I think it's important to keep that in mind that sometimes the anticipation or the dread of going back to work can be worse than actually doing it and going through it. There are a few things though that you could do or consider doing that might help in preparing. So the first thing is to think about talking to your manager ahead of time before you go back. Can, can you talk about potential accommodations you could receive from the start and what your needs are? And let them know how you're feeling heading back into your first day of work. You could also, participants have told us that they found it really helpful to kind of break the ice before actually, you know, heading to their first day of actual work. And some ways to do that might be to meet up with your colleagues informally outside of work um, to ease back into it, uh, or maybe just visit work um, and have a kind of a casual visit before your first day back. So those kinds of things can be helpful to kind of reduce the stress of that first day. Also, before you go back, think about if you want to talk about your loss at work or how you wanna talk about it. We found it that participants said it was really helpful to communicate to people at work around how much they wanna share. So I did this, for example, when I went back to work after my loss, I had a close colleague and others had been asking her how I was doing. And I shared with her that I was open to talking about my loss and that um, people could ask me questions when I came back that I was happy to share. Um, that's, that might not be the case for you. Maybe you don't wanna be asked questions, in which case it might be helpful to share that with some folks in advance before going back. So my colleague could share that with other colleagues. And when I went back, they did ask me questions and I found it really nice to talk about my baby. <laughs> um, we had a participant who wrote a letter or like an email to all of her colleagues, like a form email, everybody received it. And she said, I'm coming back to work after my pregnancy loss. I just wanted to let everybody know, um, you know, here's how I'd like to, you know, be, a, be approached. Like, I'm happy to answer questions. I'm open about it, but it would be just as legit, legitimate to say, I don't really wanna talk about my loss right now. And I prefer if others don't ask me questions at this time or wait for me to bring it up. Um, so you could maybe think about and how you could communicate that to your colleagues and your supervisor. You could also ask a colleague or a manager to share that information, like I said with my example. Um, and finally, you might want to think too about who your safe colleagues are at work. Do you have some close colleagues you're comfortable around? Can you um, avoid certain colleagues or managers, supervisors who don't feel safe to you, um, who could be a helpful ally. So those safe people could be certainly colleagues. They could be an HR rep. They could be a union rep. It could be a manager. Um, but who could it be? Could you even ask that person if they could um, take you for lunch, take you for coffee, or spend more time with that person somehow at work? On your first day back, what we've found is um, it can be really helpful to ask a colleague or manager to walk in with you on your first day back to work. And that way, when you walk in on your first day, you have somebody there with you and that person can field any questions that others might ask you or um, just be there as a support for you. 
And so some people in our study found that that was really helpful when somebody met with them and walked in with them on their first day. Also consider making it a shorter day so you don't have a long, um, exhausting day ahead. Uh, it can really reduce the level of stress. And think about, are there ways you could take extra breaks or could you find a quiet place to go, even if that's your car, um, to have a little bit of downtime or time to cry if you need to. So one of my other research studies was on just grief in the workplace. And we did interviews in this study as well. It wasn't specific to pregnancy loss, but I wanted to share this here because it shows some of the characteristics of grief supportive workplaces. And we use the acronym CARE to, um, to describe these four themes that emerged from that study. And so grief supportive workplaces are the type of workplace that communicates. So they engage in two-way communication to try to understand your needs as the employee and also to convey important information to you, like what resources you have access to through work or what your leave options might be. Now this two-way communication involves you and it's, you know, the employee plays an important role here in conveying their needs to the workplace. And without doing that, your workplace doesn't understand how to meet those needs through any kind of accommodation or information sharing or resources um, and things like that. So try to be part of that process of communication if possible to communicate your needs on an ongoing basis. Accommodation from group supportive workplaces meets the employee's needs. And these are gonna be individual to each individual employee. So no two people experiences pregnancy loss the exact same way. Um, your needs are unique and they're gonna change. So the accommodation should be informed by that two-way communication. And another element of grief supportive workplaces is that they recognize the loss. So that means just acknowledging, hey, you've been through a pregnancy loss. That's, you know, that's a lot of suffering and a lot of pain and grief. You know, and so just even recognizing that and validating that pain is really important for support. Now, beyond that initial recognition, grief supportive workplaces also provide ongoing emotional support. So that might be listening over time, showing empathy, showing compassion, taking action to continually try to alleviate suffering through effective communication, information sharing, accommodation, um, and so on. Now, these four types of support, or these four elements of grief supportive workplaces can be enacted by colleagues. They can be enacted by managers, HR reps. Um, but of course, you are the target. You are the, the employee who's suffering. So do try to take a role in that communication process and share what it is that you need on an ongoing basis. And again, it benefits your workplace as well. If you get better, <laughs> if you're not feeling well, you're probably not able to perform well. Um, now I wanna talk about stigma and si silencing because this is something that I think lies under the surface and is part of the experience for practically everybody going through pregnancy loss. Um, this quote resonated with me. It says, I need to talk openly about my loss because silencing my grief feels like another loss. Silencing my grief feels like self-abandonment. This loss has shaped me into the woman I've become. It's an important part of my story to really know me. You have to be willing to hear about it. So self-silencing is, is a part of this, the role that stigma plays in our stories. Um, and Sometimes we might not even realize we're doing it, but when we don't share our story and we don't talk about pregnancy loss, sometimes um, that can keep others from understanding how they can help us. So know, first of all, that you did nothing wrong and you're not to blame for your loss. I know it can be hard to accept. After my losses, I questioned and questioned and tried to do research to understand what went wrong. Um, and I think that that's, you know, part of the experience for many people after pregnancy loss, but, um, you know, try to not blame yourself, you know, 
and own your story. So if you miss work or you are visibly pregnant, try to have a plan for what you'll share, if anything, to explain your absence or the reality that you do not have a living baby at home if needed. Um, try, to have, try to have some way to explain what you've been through because you have a valid story, you're experiencing valid pain, and it might not seem like a workplace issue, but it is. It, it affects your work performance and a whole bunch of other work outcomes. Um, when it comes to mental illness leave, if we look at, there hasn't been a lot of literature on pregnancy loss leave specifically, but if we look at other stigmatized types of leave from work, such as mental illness, the research supports honest disclosure of what you're going through and an invitation as to how you'd prefer others to treat you. So for example, you might say, my baby died, it was awful, I'm still grieving and we're coping as best we can. I'm glad to be back at work, but I'm not up to talking about it at work yet. So the invitation is, you know, here's the explanation, the disclosure, and then here's how I'd like to interact. Or you might say, I had a miscarriage, unfortunately. I'm still healing, but I'm very open to talking about it. So there's the invitation to share and to be asked questions. You might also say, I had a miscarriage and I'm still not fully back to work. I'll let you know if there are any issues that might affect work. So it's kind of an invitation to leave you alone <laughs> and not um, ask you questions until you're back, right? So however you want to handle it, whatever your story is, what we know from other literatures is that um, if you can share a little bit, at least, about what you're going through and invite the other party to understand how you want to interact, that leads to greater support. Now, I think I've been talking about work as if it's going to be stressful and there's going to be all kinds of negative um, concerns and issues there. And that's not always the case. <laughs> so um, we, we've talked to a number of people about grief due to pregnancy loss and to other types of loss. And what we hear is that some people really find work helpful, that work itself can be beneficial if you're experiencing grief. And of course, it's going to be very individual and based on the nature of your workplace. But we've talked to many people who really appreciated being able to go to work and do something productive or maybe have ways to detach or have a break from their grief. Um, ways to be distracted in a productive way that kind of feels good. You know, the structure of work can be helpful. So we've had people say, well, I couldn't just stay at home and lie around on the couch anymore. I was getting depressed. I needed a place to go and something to do. Others find work really helpful in order to receive social support from other people, whether it's their colleagues or their supervisors. Um, others feel that it's really helpful to be productive and to achieve goals at work, you know? And then some people talked about feeling a sense of normalcy when they're back at work. So there can be a number of reasons why work is beneficial, um, even when you're going through that grief, right? Um, not all of us are able to compartmentalize our grief and our, our work lives. Um, I think to a large extent, a lot of us, we bring our whole selves to the workplace. We bring our grief with us. But if work can offer opportunities to have a break from that grief that's healthy, productive, that feels good, where we can have social support there, then that can be really helpful for some people. And that might be the case for you. And I hope that's the case for you. Now, I want to talk about interactions at work because this is one other concern that I feel some have is what are people going to say to me? Um, will others say something hurtful? Um, and this happens to pretty much everyone that somebody says something that um, might be well intentioned, but the comment is actually a little bit hurtful, you know? So the comments like, well, you can always try again you know, or it was just wasn't meant to be, you know, those types of comments can be well intentioned, but hurtful at the same time, right? Um, so in grief, remember, um, you know, these comments can be legitimately hurtful, but also we tend to be even more sensitive when we're grieving. 
and to be more easily triggered. So um, in a year from now, somebody might say the same thing to you and you might be okay with it. But early in your grief, it might be really difficult to accept some certain comments. Um, doesn't mean that they're not still legitimately painful to hear sometimes. Um, but that's why I say, if you can set boundaries and stay away from the people who are less safe, it might really prevent some of these, um, these interactions that feel negative. Um, the other helpful thing is to try to certainly anticipate those unhelpful comments and questions and how you might address them. So what might you say to somebody who says to you, you can always try again, you know? Well, that may be true, but it doesn't mean that I'm not still feeling a lot of pain for the baby that I lost. <laughs> I still lost a baby, right? So can you find ways um, that you could plan to respond to potential comments like that? Could be helpful. Um, could, and how can you avoid people who are more likely to say those things? Now, that's not always going to be possible, but you might know certain people in your workplace that are the most likely to say things like that. And maybe they're the ones you spend less time with. Um, and remember too, you don't have to accept those hurtful comments, but you can try to recognize the intention of them that usually people are trying to help even though they don't know how, or they don't know the right thing to say. Um, so you certainly don't have to accept hurtful comments um, because doing so and trying to act, um, you know, act receptive to that comment and act gracious, um, that can be its own stress. <laughs> it's called emotional labor, um, which you don't need when you're already dealing with grief. So, but try to recognize the gesture and intention. You know, you can say, well, thank you very much. I don't see it that way, but thank you. You know, um, I appreciate the thought. <laughs> um, that might help as well to deal with those comments. Anticipate them, but remember that a lot of times they're well-intentioned. People just don't know what to say. And that's all related to the whole stigma of pregnancy loss and the fact that we don't talk about it. It's silenced. Okay, so what about long-term recovery? After you've gone through that first day back to work and you're kind of, maybe you're receiving some accommodations, remember that over time, you're still healing and you might need ongoing accommodations. They may change. The types of support you need might change. Um, but in the long-term, consider any benefits you might have through work for mental health support. So do you have benefits that cover counseling? Or do you, do you have an employee assistance plan that has coverage for counseling? Um, so that could be something to look into in the longer term to take advantage of. Um, and recognize that there might be some milestone dates that approach like your due date or the baby's birthday, their death anniversary. Um, you know, the day that your miscarriage took place or the day you gave birth um, might be days that feel quite heavy to you and you might wanna consider taking a day off on those days, for example, or at least sharing with your manager, like this is a heavy day, can I work from home? Can I, you know, is there some way to manage those days because they can be heavier days. So I hope that what I shared today can be helpful for you uh, if you are going back to work after a loss or maybe you've already gone back to work, but some of the strategies I shared could still be helpful. Um, I know that especially in the workplace, pregnancy loss is like an invisible issue that women suffer with in silence. And it means that women and their partners and men too rarely receive adequate support. But really, I believe it's in part the role of the organization to support the employee in being able to continue to work and do their jobs um, as best they can, you know, to the point of undue hardship. They, they shouldn't have, they can't accommodate if it's going to be, lead to undue hardship for the organization. But whatever's reasonable, 
they, they should be willing to do. Um, so I'm so happy to be here speaking to Ended Beginnings as part of this webinar session. And thank you so much for inviting me. If you have questions or comments, my email is just stephanie underscore gilbert at cbu.ca. And um, we will be doing more and more research on this topic. So if you are interested in being put on our participant list, certainly email me, or if you have any other questions or comments, I'd love to hear from you. So thank you so much and have a great evening. Take care, bye.